Good morning, everyone. On a, on a rainy Sunday morning, it's good to see everybody. Um, it is a gentle rain, so it's a good rain, right? Yes. <clears throat> we can uh, experience the growth of the green from it. A few announcements because of some errors in the bulletin. I want you to know that the gospel reading is not correct. And um, I have the correct one up here, so you will hear the correct one. And the last hymn... Uh, is um, you're going to have to look it up in the uh, ELW, the, the Cranberry Hymnal. It, the title and the number are correct, but the insert is incorrect. So, hey, those things happen. No worries, right? We do the best we can, and we can fix all of them. So please rise as we begin our worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, Wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and our refuge. We pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. God declares... Grace is here, and in Jesus Christ's authority, your sins are forgiven. You are cherished by God. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church, 
church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and you continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all of creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. A reading from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of that prophet shall speak in my, and shall speak in my name. I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Word, word of Lord, word of life.
righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of reading from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, We know that no item in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their failing, I will never eat meat, so they may not cause one of them to fail. Word of God, word of life. Holy Gospel for this, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, comes from the first chapter of St. Mark. Glory Glory to to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples as they traveled to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath day he came, he entered the synagogue and he taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. 
And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. Today's gospel reading, Jesus casts out an unclean spirit. And when I think about that, I think about that's an absolute miracle. And then I think, do we see miracles today? And I think we do. For example, even though we scientifically can explain why it's raining, the whole process is a miracle. And we need the rain. So it's a double blessing for us. We also see miracles in healing, actually. And I've kind of told this story before, but it's always good. Many years ago, when my mother was still living, she had terrible eye trouble. And she had lost the vision completely in one of her eyes. The other Heavenly Father, help us see your miracles in everything around us, because 
they are always there. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A forgetful preacher went to a conference with the sole purpose to glean some good illustrations to bring home to use in his sermons and his ministry. He heard the conference speaker say that for the first that the first thing you say in your message should be an attention-grabbing theme. Then he heard a preacher stand up and give an example of something that's attention-grabbing. And this preacher said, I spent many of years in my, of my life in the arms of another man's wife. To which all the people listening gasped. <gasps> and he continued, she was my mother. The preacher, the forgetful preacher said, oh, I, I've got to remember that one. I really like that one. So he gets home. He couldn't wait to grab his parishioner's attention on Sunday morning. So he said, I spent many years of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Dramatic pause. And for the life of me, I just can't remember who she is. <laughs> well... He at least got their attention. And that's exactly what Jesus does today. He gets everyone's attention. You know, Jesus has this remarkable ability to capture people's attention from a variety of different audiences. His teachings and his actions and the way he lived drew people from all walks of life. He was captivating and unconventional in many ways. He used parables, stories that sometimes needed to be interpreted, that were sometimes simple and yet had profound wisdom in them. And they resonated with people from those diverse backgrounds. His teachings went beyond mere information. It touched their hearts and it stirred their souls. So not only parables were means by which Jesus did that, but miracles, as Priscilla said, performed by Jesus were powerful magnets for attention and drawing people to him, where he healed the sick and he restored sight to the blind and he raised the dead. Added to that were all of his acts of compassion and the power that he held captivated crowds, inspiring all in wonder. Jesus also had authority over nature. And you remember those stories, wonders like calming the storm or walking on water or showcasing his dominion over spiritual forces of the created world. This drew attention of those who marveled at his power over the elements. Jesus also had compassion and mercy. His willingness to heal and forgive and uplift those who were burdened by sin or suffering spoke to the deep longings of the human heart that people have. His ministry, I am convinced, was inclusive and in that it reached out to people who were considered marginalized or outcasts. He welcomed sinners and tax collectors the poor and the oppressed, a radical act in that day. And this inclusivity challenged societal norms and drew people from all walks of life to experience his love and his acceptance. His radical love, his understanding of forgiveness cut across societal norms. His teachings challenged all the legalistic mindsets of the religious leaders, and he offered a new perspective on God's love and God's grace. 
and it appealed to those who were hungering for spiritual truth and for liberation. Jesus' communication confronted hypocrisy and injustice. Overturning the tables of the money changers in the temple spoke against religious corruption. And this bold stance captured the attention of common people as well as the religious authorities. And despite his divinity, Jesus exhibited humility and approachability. He welcomed children. He engaged with the crowds. He dined with sinners. And his relatability made him accessible to people from all walks of life. His ability to capture the attention of everyone was so important to his ministry. He tore down cultural religious barriers. He drew people into some encounter with him which changed their lives. And through all of that, Jesus does one thing. Many things, but one thing I want to focus on today is Jesus invites. He gets their attention, not by forgetting the punchline, but by extending an invitation to a new kingdom, a kingdom that transcends the ordinary boundaries of those that he encounters. It's not a typical invitation, for Jesus invites those who are the most vulnerable and those who have the most need. If you remember last week, after John was arrested, Jesus returned to the wilderness and he called his first disciples. He began his kingdom with four fishermen, people that would typically not be kingdom developers. He conveyed to them the closeness of God, that God is near. And he explained to them that the Holy Spirit was coursing through him and through them. And then he extended an invitation for them to accompany him on this great journey. A journey that ensured that the presence of a loving God be made known to all people. And they followed. How amazing was that? They followed. Departing from the shores of the Sea of Galilee, they journeyed to the city of Capernaum. And Capernaum would serve as the hub for Jesus' ministry in Galilee and in the surrounding vicinity. Upon the arrival of the Sabbath, Jesus and his companions, like other devout Jews, attended the synagogue. And he began to teach. Now, according to scholars, it would not have been uncommon for Jesus to stand up and deliver a sermon and impart teachings on that day, probably because this particular synagogue did not have a designated rabbi or a teacher as we find in our contemporary world today. It was just customary for individuals who were known throughout the community for their wisdom to be given the opportunity to address the weekly gatherings alongside the educated elite. So one could infer from this that Jesus had already earned a reputation for wisdom, that he was already known for the things that he did, and that that led to his invitation to speak in front of the group. Perhaps it was this very reputation that motivated James and John to become his followers. Charisma, we might say in today's world. But regardless, he proceeded to teach and the contents of his teachings proved to be so surprising to people. Because Jesus taught with authority. And he astounded those who were present. And in the middle of all of that, During that time in the synagogue, a man possessed by an unclean spirit confronted Jesus. Now you need to know that I can go in many, many different directions with that text. But here comes the twist of of the gospel. 
Jesus' actions during his ministry were radical and revolutionary. He challenged societal norms, he challenged religious traditions, and he challenged cultural expectations of his day. And don't you find it interesting, looking closely at that gospel, that the first response to Jesus were the demons or the unclean spirits. Today a man with an unclean spirit encounters Jesus right at the beginning of his ministry. Now, a little background here, because we're now in Mark, not in Matthew, and we've spent a year in Matthew, but now we need to look at Mark and what Mark's goals are. The writer of the Gospel of Mark has a purpose for this. Mark tells these stories so that we understand that Jesus goes to the desolate places of our lives and calls those who are far away from the kingdoms of this world. In other words, Mark's focus is that Jesus travels to the outcasts of our society. And this is the way Mark's gospel goes. These are short stories that are connected and they invite people into the kingdom. They are progressively structured in function of the places. So today's text is in the Jewish synagogue. And next week's text will be in the Christian house. And the third week's text, if we were to have that, was to be in the public square. To the villages or towns or the regions where the gospel would be proclaimed. And they're linked by the desolation. They're linked by a spirit, by a paralyzed man, by a publican. And Mark takes and distributes Jesus' ability in a precise plan, in an organized space, if you will. And the space is divided into three sectors into the synagogue, into the home, and to the house door. But they, each of them, represent an aspect of our lives. Today's text shows the synagogue as a place of public prayer, the community of faith. The house that will be talked about next week is a place of private life, and the door that is to say the external space, we say the square, the public square, a place of public life. So for Mark, there becomes this clear connection between that which is religious and that which is profane, between that which is private and that which is public. Mark wants us to know that Jesus' actions is of interest to the human being as a whole. We can't just relegate Jesus to the spiritual life, but Jesus becomes part of all of the dimensions of our lives. That which is the religious, that which is the home, the private, and that which is the public space. This leads us to understand that Jesus does not stay only in the religious spaces of our lives, but enters into the sphere of private life, affecting our relationships with individuals, and that he also journeys with us throughout the world. So I take him to the drive through at McDonald's or wherever I go. So the demons being spiritual entities and having certain level of spiritual discernment Recognize the divine presence and authority of Jesus. That apparently was not apparent to others at the time. And it becomes clear in this interaction that the demonic realm might have insight into who Jesus is and what Jesus' mission might be on earth. That Jesus' mission is to bring salvation and healing and liberation I wonder, I wonder if they in their recognition understand the spiritual significance of Jesus' presence. 
if they understand the significance of Jesus' identity. Because you see, these rebellious beings opposed God and reacted with hostility and recognition when they are confronted by the divine authority of Jesus. So by reacting the way they react, the demon-possessed man served as a testimony to the authority that Christ held and to the authority that Christ holds over the spiritual realm. So by testifying to the authority of Jesus, this man, this demon-possessed man, set the stage for Jesus to demonstrate his authority over anything that is unclean. Now, take a moment to think about all that has happened during this season after Epiphany. Jesus taught that God's nearness was at hand and encouraged people to re-embrace the age-old principles of compassion and love that God had originally instilled in the establishment of the law that somehow over the years whittled away. Then Jesus, exercising his authority, showed the people a new way to live. He did that first in his baptism when he made himself vulnerable to John, thereby opening himself up to receive that Holy Spirit. Perhaps there's a vulnerability in our baptism too. And next, Jesus did this when he began his public ministry. Rather than doing it alone, he invited along James and John, disciples and co-workers, who would tell people of the nearness of God. A team effort. And finally, in this story, by reaching out to the tormented man and freeing him of the force that controlled him. Within these few verses, Jesus develops a new teaching, a new way of being in authority, that did not reside in military might or philosophical acumen but instead was best understood through vulnerability and mutuality and compassion for those who are marginalized. So by teaching and claiming his authority, Jesus redefines the conventional understanding that was prevalent at his time. And we, you and I, are invited to a paradigm shift towards that which he taught. We are invited to be vulnerable. We are invited to mutually work together and to have compassion for those that are marginalized. That is the kingdom. Emphasizing a leadership model that focuses on service and includes and transforms lives through love and forgiveness. And it is this vision of authority that remains a powerful and countercultural message for our contemporary world today, and you and I as followers of Jesus. But our challenge lies in how we as followers of Christ can embody and wield this transformative kind of authority. And it is the season of epiphany that serves as a poignant reminder of God's manifestation to the world. So as we embrace this mindset, as we open ourselves to the profound and the transformative power of God's love, as it is illuminated and revealing to our journey of faith, we practice vulnerability and mutuality and compassion. We not only transform our own lives in doing so, but we also impact the lives of those around us. That, my friends, is our divine calling. We are called to be the hands of Christ, and we are called to extend welcoming embrace to those who are broken, including ourselves, and to guide each and every one back to a place of wholeness where Jesus heals through word and sacrament. Does Jesus have our attention today? 
May we be that kind of light for this little corner of our world. Amen. join our voices together to profess our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation. 
Amen. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessings on the church, the world, and all of creation. Loving God, we pray that your example of teaching with confidence and authority builds up your church in love. May all your church leaders and teachers honor your instruction and model, and, and model your inclusive ways. Lord, in your mercy, your renewing God, we pray for all of creation, that waterways flow clean and clear, that natural spaces are protected, and that our planet is healed. Let us commit to thoughtful care of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, justice-seeking God, we pray for those in government and community leadership, that they lead with honor and mindfulness. May they remember their covenants and be upright in their ways. Lord, in your mercy, compassionate God, we pray for all who are in need, especially those who have known rejection, those who have any kind of struggle with long-term illness or chronic pain, those without access to safe housing or health care, and any who suffer. Lord, in your mercy, still speaking, God, we pray for this congregation, for its artists and its musicians, for its educators and its caregivers, that all gifts are used to care for those in need and to live out your example of accompaniment, gospel, witness, and love. Lord, in your mercy, Eternal God, we remember all who have been teachers and mentors and companions in the church and in its life. We especially remember St. Thomas Aquinas, who we commemorate today. We trust that all who have died rest in your loving care. Lord, in your mercy, knowing that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers within our own hearts. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table, that we receive what we seek and follow you, your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Holy One be with you. And also with you. Open your hearts to the one who is love. Let us give thanks to God who welcomes the stranger. To the one who reaches across every border, we give thanks and praise. In the wonder of your expansive embrace, we give you praise, O God. Through your radical welcome, you re renew the limitations, of, you reveal the limitations of our own imaginations. You break down walls and boundaries, and we don't even realize that we have erected them. Like the magi guided by the light of star through foreign territory, you call all of us towards you. You lead your people across borders of hate and into lands of curious and different. You strengthen us as we journey, learning and unlearning stories about one another. Gathered in your presence, we come to recognize the gifts of community, rich in diversity. Therefore, we join our voices with your people on earth and the whole company of the heavens, singing praise to you. mysterious ways, O oh God. That journey, this journey with you is filled with more questions than answers. Each time we think we have you figured out, you surprise us again, revealing yourself in new ways. In Jesus, we saw your radical welcome of strangers extended in challenging ways, in ways that disrupt our traditions and upsettle, unsettle our comfort zones. For Jesus broke religious rules in order to include all people. He lifted up the sacredness of the people in places that were deemed unclean. He cared more about the well-being of the oppressed than his own reputation. Jesus taught us to rethink your presence among us, but we couldn't accept it. Resistance to transformation, your people sent him to the cross. And on the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup. He blessed it and shared it saying, this cup that is poured out is the new covenant. In remembrance of all that you have done to save us, we proclaim this mystery of faith. Christ was birthed among us. Christ was killed among us. 
Christ rises again among us. May the same spirit that lifted Christ from the grave be poured out upon these gifts. Make this bread and this cup be an extension of your welcome, a welcome that knows no bounds. Fill us with the courage and the faith to join you in the work of tearing down walls that exclude and pointing to the sacred in the margins. In collective longing for a taste of your kingdom on earth, we join together in echoing the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the land is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, Heaven and earth are joined as one. Come and see.
and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Giver of every gift, Christ's body is our food and we are Christ's body. Raise us to the life, raise us to life by your power for the benefit of all and to the glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you. Jesus grant you grace and truth and the Spirit send peace upon your hearts now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Well, I hope you have a few because there's like three pages of announcements today. <laughs> okay, so for this week, we have a welcome meeting after worship this morning in Luther Hall. Tuesday, 2 and 7, are the Christian Life Study in the pastor's office. Wednesday, Bible study is at 1230 in the library. Next Sunday, Word and Sacrament at 10. The First Wednesday Club is having their Valentine's bingo party on February 7th at 2 p.m. We really have fun. It lasts approximately two hours. Everyone is welcome. Please think about coming. We have um, asked for two $5 gifts wrapped and a little food to share it can be a snack, nothing major. But we do have a good time. There is a collection being taken for the homeless. Um, donations to the homeless community, ideas of what they would like are tarps, six by eight feet or larger, blankets, duct tape. That's a little scary. I don't know why they need duct tape, but anyway. Gatorade or, um, <laughs> pardon me, it fixes, it fixes everything, they say, okay. Um, electrolyte drinks like Gatorade, Powerade, those things. Toilet paper, jerky treats, uh, Slim Jims, that kind of thing. Salty snacks like chips, granola bars. Hygiene items, individual sizes, socks and wool items. Okay, the Deconstructing Christianity Rebuild is where? February 8th. February 8th, oh I see, at the Garage on King, which just recently opened. Um, and that is, I don't know what time. It's okay, move on. We, okay, move on. Uh, we just elected council members, in case you would like to know who they are. The council president is Brenda Morrison. The vice president is Cindy Motes. Secretary Andrew Banks. Treasurer Linda Payne. And non, oh, their non-council. Uh, Assistant Treasurer Sharon Brumbach. Sally Jenkins, Ann Moore, Bev Murphy, Michael Knoll, myself, Roxy O'Connor, Sarah Shoebridge, Laura Sinner, Corey Stevens, and Bill Torbert make up the rest of the council. What else have we got? Ah, there will be a pancake supper for Shrove Tuesday. We're planning it right now. Pancakes, bacon, sausage, sausage gravy, biscuits, juice, coffee, um, and a fruit of some sort. That will be held on the 13th of February from 4.30 to 7 p.m. And we would appreciate either signing up on a sign-up sheet, which is downstairs where you sign in when you come into church, or call the church office um, and get your name down, how many people would be attending. Or on the Facebook page, I believe you can respond as well. And we would like that by February 5th so that we make sure we have enough food for everybody. And then we have Lent coming. So there's an Ash Wednesday worship service at noon in the Luther Hall and at 7.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. 
and then at starting midweek worship for the next six Wednesdays after that would be noon worship in Luther Hall and um, in the evening, 6 p.m., a soup supper in the chapel that's followed by 7 p.m. worship in the chapel as well. And for the soup supper, there's usually two soups and some bread, and there are sign-up sheets for that as well. Monday, Thursday worship, 7.30 p.m. in the sanctuary, and Good Friday worship, noon and 7.30 worship in the sanctuary. And that's it. Anyone else have announcements? Priscilla? did forget one thing. There's an annual congregational meeting and a potluck dinner scheduled for Sunday, February 18th, following worship. Please bring a covered dish and any reports that are due by January 31st, if you have reports. Thank you.
Go in peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.